Okay, so Russian campaign. This is a sort of a, a audio and visual notes. Um, pretty interesting game. Obviously, this is a um, a timeless classic of the wargaming hobby, and it's it's one that I would say every wargamer should probably play at some point. Uh, I do think it's an it's an essential experience. Now, first released in 1974 by Jed Co, designed by John Edwards, later released by Avalon Hill, still later released in a deluxe edition by L2, and more recently released in two sort of parallel versions, one from GMT, a deluxe fifth edition, and one from Compass Games, which is a designer signature edition replica, if you will, of the original Jedco version. So I chose to play, based on the fact that it's a it's a purer iteration of the original, um, the Compass version, rather than the, the, the somewhat fancier GMT version. Although the Compass version is pretty nice, too. Uh, but it is half-inch counters. A lot of people will squeal about that. Um, it is a mounted map. Um, the um, GMT version has two, mount two maps, uh, which are available mounted, but if you just buy the game, you'll get the unmounted versions. So everything I'm going to say is kind of tuned to somebody from my position, which is somebody who's new at uh, Russian Campaign and who hasn't played it a million times. Like I said, it's been around since 1974, and this is one of those games from an era when you could only really probably count on getting one or two new games a year, and so people played the pants off of whatever games it was that they had. So for uh, Russian Campaign veterans, a lot of what I'm about to say is probably going to sound vacuously superficial, but here we are, right? If you, uh, if you have not played it, I would recommend finding somebody to play it with and playing it. It will be a better experience uh, two-handed rather than solitaire, in my opinion. Now, as a game that people played the pants off of back in the day, a lot of holes were found, a lot of exploits, a lot of balance issues. Probably those things are not going to be incredibly apparent the first few times you play the game. If you play it a lot, you'll undoubtedly find those issues sooner or later. And those issues motivated a lot of the changes that took place between the Jedco version and the Avalon Hill version, the Avalon Hill version and the L2 version, and the L2 version and the Deluxe 5th Edition. The game feels simultaneously elegant and primitive. Um, there are zones of control, and they are hard-locking zones of control. There is a slightly asymmetric sequence of play, but most of the asymmetry comes in how the units move in the second impulse. So each turn contains two impulses. You can move and fight, um, and then you can move and fight again. But in the second impulse, you are somewhat limited in terms of what you can move and how far it can move. And how you are limited depends on who you are, right? The Germans are much, much, much less limited than the Soviets, for example. At the same time, the Soviets get reinforcements every turn, or replacements, I should say, every turn, where the Germans only get replacements once a year. Reinforcements come in on a schedule for both sides, and obviously the Soviets get more reinforcements than the Germans as well. The game features a mechanic that I do not like, and that is mandatory attacks. So how that works is that when you are in an enemy Zoc, you must attack. If an enemy is in your Zoc, you must attack. It doesn't necessarily have to be one for one, so you can spread those attacks out. You can attack different enemy stacks that are in your Zocs with uh, different counters of yours. But what this can result in, and of course this is one of the classic issues that a lot of people have with mandatory attacks, sometimes called soak-off attacks, is that you can be placed into a position as a defender where you are forced to make it, you are either forced to retreat or to make an unfavorable mandatory attack, and you could be eliminated. I actually lost Leningrad in the game I just played because of this. I was forced to make a shitty attack out of Leningrad. I rolled a one, I got an attacker eliminated, so the Germans just walked into Leningrad. Interestingly, there is no advance after combat. The role of advance after combat is really kind of taken up by the second impulse movement, which means, of course, that the Germans are much more able to exploit those newly vacated hexes than the Russians are. Um, consensus seems to be that the game is overall balanced in favor of the Soviets. That may be true, uh, and I, I think I saw signs of that right. The German execution early in the game has to be very, very clean, very, very good, and very, very aggressive. Um, if that's not the case, then I think the Soviets will end up pulling it off. But even as early as like mid-42, 1942, I think you will start to see uh, strong signs of the German momentum eroding. Now, one of the interesting things, especially about 
about the Compass Games Jedco Replica Edition is just how tight the rules are. There are some gaps in those rules because those rules are only 12 pages, uh, but it is an amazing amount of gameplay stuffed into those 12 pages. This is characterized by an almost total absence of chrome. If you get the 5th edition, then you will get some additional chrome built into the core rules, as well as uh, a lot of optional rules and variants that are also included in that. Now, of the various packages that are available, uh, I would probably recommend picking up the GMT Deluxe 5th edition because it gives you the most options, and therefore I would say it gives you the most potential for replayability because you can change things up as you continue to play through the game. However, if you want that sort of pure experience, then I would say go for the Compass Games Jedco Replica Edition, the Designer Signature. I think it's called the Designer Signature Edition. Um, it's very nicely done. It is half-inch counters. It is one map, mounted map. Um, it is quite nice. I have an unboxing video of that, so go ahead and check out that unboxing video if you are so inclined to see the specifics of the components. And for that matter, I have an unboxing of the GMT Deluxe 5th Edition as well. If there was a list of the 10 most important games in the history of wargaming, a Russian campaign would surely be on it. So I do recommend, again, as I said earlier, um, everybody should try to play this game. Every war gamer should 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 play a game or two of Russian Campaign. I think it will find you will find it an instructive experience, even if you decide in the end that the game is too light for you or that there are balance problems or whatever. I think it is a, a, a an important part of the experience, and it will also shed some light on where the design space was back in 1974 when this game came out. I will point out that this isn't the first game on the East Front. In fact, the monster game Drangnak Austin from GD had come out prior to Russian Campaign. And that's very interesting as well. So Russian Campaign, it is a recommended experience. Uh, you should not have a ton of trouble finding somebody with a copy if you don't feel like buying it who's willing to play it with you. Another thing that I, I will note is that I played through this thing, now, I mean, it, admittedly it's solitaire, uh, but I played through this thing extremely quickly. Uh, a few years ago at Buckeye Game Fest, this is probably close to 10 years ago now, I saw some uh, a, a pair of individuals playing it, and they took basically almost the entire week to play through Russian Campaign. And they were playing the L2 version, and maybe that's a lot more detailed, I don't think so, but uh, maybe that's a slower playing, uh, but I found myself a bit baffled as to how it took those guys that long. Now, it's not a super quick playing game overall, if you play it all the way to 1945, just because there's a lot of turns. But the individual turns move very quickly, at least they did for me. I mean, you'd expect it to with 12 pages of rules, right? So those are my thoughts on my newly minted experience fooling around with Russian Campaign, in my case, in the Compass Games edition from 2021, I believe. So recommended. Um, check it out. Um, available nowadays from both Compass and from uh, GMT, and I think Art Lupinacci may actually still have some copies of the L2 version as well, but you'll probably have to inquire directly with Art to get that. Now, another option for you is to check out Russia Besieged, also currently available from Compass Games, and there's a, a player's guide and the Finnish expansion should be out any time now. Those are both by Art Lupinacci, and they represent sort of a next-gen um, Russian campaign with a lot more Chrome, like a lot more Chrome. Um, and for those who felt good about the Russian campaign experience but just wanted more meat on its bones, then uh, Russia Besieged is definitely where I would look first. However, that said, there are an enormous number of answers to Russian campaign in the history of wargaming, right? I mean, one can even point to games like uh, Hold Fast Russia or uh, The Dark Valley by Ted Racer as successors or answers to the Russian campaign, even if they don't copy its mechanics or anything like that. So if you have thoughts on Russian Campaign, please leave them in the comments below. I appreciate you watching. If you would like to help support the channel and support what we do here, uh, there are links to the Patreon and the merch store and other ways to support the channel in the video description, so check those out. And a big shout out to the patrons of Ardwolf Slayer, without whose support, assistance, and encouragement, it would be impossible to continue doing the stuff that we do here on the channel. So thank you, patrons. Meanwhile, thank you for watching, and until next time, happy wargaming.